It is 1.30 on Tuesday, August 4th, 2020, and you are at the Wausau Water Works Commission meeting. First item on the agenda is to approve the minutes of July 7th, 2020 meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion by Herb, second by Robinson. Is there any discussion? Any? All right. Um, all those voting in favor of approving the minutes can signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We are moving on to item number two, the director's report on the utility operations. I'll pass it over to Eric. It's on certain line items, but um, one of the items, finance is here. Um, I know that question came up on the borrowing versus the operating budget revenues and uh, debt issuance, and uh, you know how we make those determinations too. So, if you want any elaboration on anything with that, um, Marianne. Yeah, Commissioner Jean. I have a question about the uh, invite for COVID. Well, this says COVID study. Uh, that's from the state uh, lab of hygiene. Yes. Um, I think that's, I support that. I don't have a problem with it. But is the, when we draw the sample at the influent, is it just influent or are we doing affluent too? I believe it's just influent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the purpose of the test is it would be looking for genetic material that would indicate whether the virus was present or not, not whether it's active or dead or alive. And so it would be used to estimate or predict the amount of the, of the epidemic or the infection in the community. And not, it's not going to tell us whether the wastewater is hazardous or what safety precautions we might want to take. So it doesn't address that part of the wastewater. Yes. The container, is it the normal influent container that we would be utilizing? Like one day it goes to the lab and then there's another one that re takes the sample for the current day? I, I believe that they are composite samples. So our composite sampler collects a big jug of water. Right. And then we're taking that back to the lab anyway. So then there'll be a procedure, which we don't have yet. but the technician in the lab would put some into a sample bottle to ship to the Wisconsin State Lab of Hygiene, and then other samples we test in the lab or ship out somewhere else for testing. The question would be, is it supposed to be specific for that day? And if so, are the containers sterilized to put back for the, for the next 24-hour composite? Because it didn't say anything in their protocol about that, but it, Seems to me it would make some sense, and you may want to ask them that. Otherwise, you could have carryover after you dump the sample out, after you're done testing whatever you need to do. Or sure. Um, we would certainly get a protocol from them, but if there's one drop of leftover, which there won't be, they get rinsed. But if there's one drop of leftover in this big two-gallon container, it would still be a small percentage-wise, even though we're probably looking for stuff in the parts per trillion, quadrillion, some range, I don't know. But yeah, we, we would get a procedure from the state lab before we collected samples. That was my point. Thank you. Yeah. Any other discussion? All right. Just if oh. I could, and yes. Bellish, there have been, or my, my chair of the Board of Health had, but there, there have been a number of studies across the country where they've utilized wastewater influent is sort of a precursor for the prevalence of, of COVID in the community, and it, it then allows them to look at targeting of testing and, and other things. And I think they're trying to see if that's a useful tool because we still don't have testing capacity equal to the need um, anywhere um, in the state. So it's, it'll be an interesting study, and I, I uh, look forward to seeing what the results of that study might be. Me too. Yes, Commissioner Forrest. This is five, yeah. Uh, Eric, the uh, Clark Deeds study on the uh, on solar at the uh, drinking water facility, a proposal is forthcoming? Yeah, 
So I, uh, I just wanted to inform that I, I wanted to work with Clark Dietz because they already have all the information on the power. Exactly. You, you know, so it seemed to be very reasonable to work with them because they have all that information No, already. I think that's a logical approach as well. Loads. Um, what is going to happen to the proposal once one is put together? Uh, we'll bring it back hopefully in September uh, to the commission for their review. Uh, and then it would be your choice whether to move forward with that or not. Would it go to the council following our action? Uh, it could. It very well could. Um, the commission has full authority to approve that contract, but, um, you know, if you'd like, we can move that on to council uh, as well. Okay. I would just hope that when this evaluation, when this proposal is, is um, uh, exists, that we would evaluate it not just on cost effectiveness because a lot of mm -hmm. solar projects are abandoned because it doesn't work out from the normal standards of cost effectiveness return over two or three years. And that we would also take the environmental and community service aspect of solar power into account as we evaluate that. Thanks. Yeah, you bet, Jim. I, I fully agree with you on that as well. Mr. Robinson. So the question relative to that solar contract, what, what are we expecting the, the cost of that to be? And, and um, help me understand, you know, so have we sole sourced at Clark Beats? And are there other people, you know, what's their background in this? And are there other providers that could look at it as well? Well, I think there's other engineering firms that could help us out with it too. I mean, the advantage of Clark Dietz is, is they've designed all of the power requirements for the drinking water treatment facility. So they have all of that work done ahead of time. Um, they already know what the power loads would be. Um, you know, I, I don't know uh, what size of facility we would be designing. Um, anything over 20 kW would be, we would definitely be doing, but that has, um, some requirements that we have to have an engineer of record sign off on that design. So, um, I mean, having, you know, to work with an engineering firm who already has a full background uh, over the last couple of years in the design is very beneficial from the utility standpoint. So what is the goal of the solar component? Is it to be self-sufficient? Is it to be um, supplemental? Do we have a a stated policy goal as to what we're trying to achieve with our solar system? Supplemental. Panels. We want to, the idea right now would be to generate, uh, you know, to an economical, um, you know, we, we could design a huge solar, right? But the payback, if we put it back on the grid, is very low, WPS. And so the idea is to economically design a system that could supplement the power usage and also anything we generate would be used um, to help offset our costs. Uh, there might be some times during low usage, possibly we put it back on the grid, but WPS is, their mm -hmm. wholesale rate is, is poor at, at this point in time. And I don't know if that's gonna change at all, but yeah. I, I know that the county was looking at, um, or EDP was looking at putting a solar system out in the western part of the county in, in and they have delayed that project because there's no market for that excess solar power at this time. But let me go back to the, the qualifications of Clark Beats. This is an area of, of specific expertise. Do we have that expertise with Clark Beats or are there other firms that could, given this unique nature of solar power generation, give us more bang for the dollar? Well, Clark Dietz is currently working with other municipalities doing the same thing. So um, Tanya's on the line if, if she wanted to talk about some of the other facilities that she's working with. You want me to, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you, Tanya. Yeah, so just briefly, um, we've done um, over 100 megawatts of solar um, projects and those range from rooftop to utility scale ground monitor arrays, the largest being um, for DT Energy in lower Michigan. Um, and, and I can provide that information if it would make you feel a little bit more comfortable. I have a um, write-ups on various projects. Um, right now we're working on a handful of projects. Um, probably the closest one in the state right now is for um, Parkland College. 
Um, and that one is uh, in design and construction. It's kind of a design build scenario at this time. So um, there's a, a number of them active and then um, under our belts already finished and running are um, just over 100 megawatts of solar power. And again, this goes back to the issue that I raised. Um, do we have a procurement policy for by which we move proposals forward? I would encourage us to develop that policy because these are spinoff. We do have design. a procurement policy. It, it allows us to sole source with, um, you know, sufficient um, justification moving ahead. If the if the body here feels like we should send out an RFP, we could certainly do that. With our RFPs and professional services, we don't necessarily make decisions based just on cost. That's usually a very low priority. So what are, what are you estimating the cost of this contract to be? I do not know. That would be uh, moving ahead with working through that proposal. I guess I put it on here to, you know, if anybody had any questions on that because I didn't want to, mm -hmm. you know, move forward if you weren't, uh, you know, with the sole source uh, contract for the engineering, so. Well, I think that, so are you looking for concurrence with moving forward versus, you know, it's hard as a commissioner to say that, yes, we should move forward without having a concept of what the cost would be. Yeah, I mean, if you didn't want to, I mean, if you're not willing to say, you know, we're in support of moving forward directly with Clark Dietz, then we would do an RFP, which I, I guess the establishment of an RFP is, is staff time and everything up front, and we can certainly do that. Um, it's just I didn't, I didn't want to go through the process and have meetings with Clark Dietz alone and stuff if the commissioners weren't, you know, supportive of doing a sole source, so. I think this is probably an opportunity for us to look at our city procurement policy. I know it's been updated um, and maybe ensure that what we're doing um, kind of jives with the will of the body. Um, I think that's I think that's fair. And getting kind of an estimate of the, the cost will be important, but also some of the other um, criteria that we're judging this project on, um, making sure that we have that fully outlined too. Maybe that will help us understand exactly the trade-offs for solar versus whatever else. It, my experience has been that there is always value in not only reviewing the proposal of the successful consultant, but there are many times where there are valuable ideas floated by other people in the in the context of it. And I, while I understand Clark Beat's relationship to the project, we're talking about a separate component that is that is unique to that component um, in in the design of because you're basically going to tie into your your grid system or your power system. So I'm, I'm not sensing that it is uniquely, they're uniquely qualified to do it, but rather there may be others with additional expertise. I just would encourage you to look at whether or not there are there are other uh, sources of the, the services and Clark Deets may be the most qualified. I, I can't answer that at this time, but uh, I think there's value sometimes in in floating the idea out with others to see what the universe of knowledge is and, and differences of approach might be. Well, I guess if there's not a consensus here, I'd just move forward with an RFP. I, I, you know, waiting another month just kind of puts us back if that's how, you know, if there's not really a consensus here with the commission. I, I think we need to get something on board mm -hmm. and moving ahead. So, uh, so I can put together an RFP over the next month and then we'll put it out for a couple of weeks and. Uh, see what kind of interest we get on that. Yes, Mr. Chain. Are we done with that Sure, we are still in the director's report, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you might need to turn your mic on. Do you know wastewater plant inspection? I'm sorry. That's all right. Under the wastewater uh, uh, plant inspection by the DNR, uh, Dave, there was three or four things that, and I think the most glaring, I'm assuming was the most glaring, is that our, uh, was it the influent wasn't uh, providing accurate information on the incoming flow, is, is that correct? 
The issue we had was with the effluent meter and the way we calibrate it. And it's uh, kind of difficult because we've got it's a fancy little self-contained device and there isn't much of a way to calibrate it. So we've been doing that by using our old um, uh, weir and uh, transducer. But we can only do that when the UV system, when the lights are out or when the flows are low because otherwise the UV system requires it to be backed up to the extent where that um, effluent meter isn't uh, usable. And so he wanted us to kind of clarify the process we're using to do that. Um, the issue will go away with the new construction. We'll have new mag meters. Each of the four effluent pumps will have a separate mag meter. And then uh, that'll give us a lot more information as far as what we're pumping. Thank you. Is there any other, any more comments? Yes, Mr. So a question for Miriam because she came to the meeting. Mm -hmm. So what is the threshold for borrowing versus a, a capital fund, funded, ex, you know, or budgeted uh, expense? And so do we have a, a policy per se or is it? We don't have a policy on what the cost of a specific capital project is before uh, we can borrow for it. It's uh, more about matching the life of the asset with uh, debt retirement. So you wouldn't want to, let's say, borrow for a three-year computer over 10 years. You would want to, you know, pay for that computer with cash. So we're, you know, regularly working on matching the asset. So, for instance, you've got you've got your capital expenditures in IT and rolling stock. Would those be typically operational? Or? Yes, yeah, and, so, and those would take place on the city side. But even mm -hmm. for the utility, we don't borrow for rolling stock. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So typically, it's um, major improvements to the plant. Of course, now we're you know doing some huge improvements to the plant. Uh, but also some of the, it, you know, the main work and the major infrastructure work underground, the uh, crossings that we did in the river would be a good example of what we've recently borrowed for. So we historically have been issuing and piggybacking on the city's uh, general obligation capacity for the utility. And then a couple of years ago, you know, given all of our um, big economic development projects, we saw that we were going to run tight in, you know, potentially geo capacity, uh, and we wanted to, you know, restrict that for city use. So at that time, uh, we issued our first revenue bonds, which we hadn't issued revenue bonds in a in a long, long time. So there's two issues outstanding for both the water and the sewer right now. An issue that we um, did in 2017, and then again in 2019. Uh, both of those were 20-year issues where we just have a flat principal and interest payment, like a mortgage, you know, where you pay the same amount and over time your principal um, payment goes up and your interest payment goes down, but it remains level through the life of your loan. This year, in 2020, we wanted to issue revenue bonds again for some capital projects as a means of trying to save on debt issuance, I had um, proposed to our financial advisors, what if we looked at doing a two-year, you know, look at what our needs are for a two-year period, but issue only do one issue. So that's why we are now, in August, we're kind of trying to fine tune those plans. We would issue the debt sometime um, in third or even fourth quarter and then we would reimburse ourselves for the funds that we've expended this year and then have the rest of the proceeds to draw in 2021. I always get confused with what year it is during budget time but yeah in 2021 um, and that would you know kind of reduce the amount of times we'd have to go and borrow um, and um, reduce our debt issuance costs then. So what are the arbitrage requirements right now? Arbitrage, well, it depends on um, how much we've borrowed, but, you know, we have to spend the lion's share of it in two years. So that's why if we kind of reimburse ourselves and then just do the next year, we should be well within the arbitrage. Um, and, of course, with low interest rates right now, 
it's really hard to get into an arbitrage situation anyhow. So. And what is the difference in basis points between a revenue bond and a GO bond? Well, so the um, the issues in 2019, the the 20 year that we issued was about two about two and a half percent over the two years, the true interest rate. And I think we did the fire station, and it was about 2.19. So not. A significant amount, but so you know, what, what was the timing on that? Because I think Car County borrowed for, don't hold me to this, 1.17. Oh, in this year? Yes. Yeah. Well, I was referring to 2019's yeah. issues. So we um, are going for our 2020 issue for our general obligation. Mm -hmm. And our financial advisor was expecting we would get under 1%, maybe. So I think we'll see great rates. Most definitely. Any other questions? Awesome. Great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any more discussion on the director's report? Otherwise, we can put this on file. OK. Uh, moving on to item number three, discussion and possible action. Increasing the grant amount for private side lead service line replacement from 3000 to $5,000. I know we've had a couple of discussions mm -hmm. on this, but why don't you I don't know who wants to take this one, kind of brief in us. Yeah, at the last meeting, there was a consensus um, that probably the best thing to do, especially for projects that, um, for replacing private side lead service line on the priority list, the commission said a couple of years ago, we're, we're down to previous um, construction projects. And, uh, and so there's some added costs with those with sidewalks, curb, potential curb replacement and um, that normally we wouldn't have on our street reconstruction projects. So to increase that specifically for uh, prior year projects from the grant amount from 3000 to $5,000, um, you know, to get more interest to cover that and, and hopefully get more of the lead out of the ground. Do I have a motion? A motion by Herb, second by Jean. Yes, Mr. Forrest. Question. I just wanted to ask Scott, uh, what the numbers are for, for the recent period on replacements. I mean, are we doing any better? Or are we still pretty much stuck for the, the past at the projects, level we were at? For the past projects, we still have two that we've paid for. There are a lot of people that have shown interest, but nobody has um, moved forward with them. Two since the last meeting? Two total. total. Those were the two that we had last time also. And how much money remains in our account for this year? About 150000 Okay. So we could do, we could do 25 had, projects um, if we go to 5,000. Correct. That would cover 25 projects. Thank you. We've had we've had actually 47 people that have shown interest or at least contact us with interest um, in past construction projects. But I think the funding level and the cost of the projects has deterred a lot of people. Um, I would hope if we do have an increase that we would go back and at least notify these 47 people and have them on a first come first serve basis and get that money taken care of. Mr. Jean. Uh, other than the sanitary, I mean, it, the pipe, if I read it correctly, they typically pay for the pipe because it's not eligible cost. Is there any other cost that the homeowner would, would, uh, wouldn't be eligible under the 5,000? No, it's just the sanitary line. Is this not to exceed 5,000? So it could be one that would be 4,100 and they're not going to get 5,000. Right, up to 5,000. Uh, up. Yeah, so if the cost. Oh, yeah, they don't get to keep the change. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Is there any more discussion on this? Are we ready to vote? All right, I think we're ready to vote. All those in favor of uh, increasing the grant amount for private side lead service line replacements from 3,000 to 5,000, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Nobody, that passes unanimously, thank you. Uh, moving on to item number four, discussion and possible action on issuing additional tedious excavation permits prior to their current permits being completed and closed. Um, maybe I'll let our director here explain the situation. Yeah, so we had, um, as you know, TDS is in the city, uh, putting fiber throughout the city and neighborhoods. Um, they've broken down the city into, I, I, 
kind of off the good, but I thought like 87 sections, so 87 permits um, that that you know to issue for and. The city requires an excavation permit for any work that's being done in the right of way by an outside entity. And so the TDS has 16 crews in the city right now working in various areas. They want to bring in another four to six crews. So they want the issuance of an additional six permits. And right now they haven't closed out the permits that they have yet. And the problem that we're running into on the utility side is the locates. So if they don't close out a permit within 30 days, they have to come back and request that permit again, pay for it, and they're on their fourth generation of these permits because they're not completing those sections of the city. And every time that they don't complete, they call in a relocate, and our guys are going out and relocating again. And if we, you know, I'm, I'm asking the commission to, you know, support not issuing additional permits throughout the city uh, until TDS closes the permits that they have out outstanding. Um, some of the issues they're having is getting materials in to finish those and they're on back order or um, they just haven't been delivered yet. But from our staffing standpoint, I mean, we have people out every day. That's all they're doing is locates. And, you know, we have other priority work to do. And so, but by law, obviously, we're required to do this. And so, um, trying to mitigate this um, to, to the extent possible. I know I've talked with Alan, the city engineer. He's not in favor of issuing additional permits, and I thought it would be beneficial because really the majority of the locates are at, for the city are actually with the utility. Um, they've also had conversations. I don't know who's, who's locating for power and um, phone and stuff, too. Is that They contract that out, right? They're having a hard time keeping up as well. I don't know. Is it SCI or? I cannot remember yeah. the name of it off right off the hand, but they are. Um, they're running. They're running additional people and additional hours, and trying to keep up. And no, nobody's really having much luck with that. Right. I think that there's going to be a push from TDS to the city uh, at some point here in the near future. They've been pushing us pretty hard. And so I thought I'd get this before the commission because this, this directly relates to the utility and our staffing ability, you know, to keep up with this. And I, I just, I don't think it's unreasonable for us to ask them to complete the work that they have outstanding right now before we issue them additional areas that they can bring in and work. I, I don't feel that's outside the realm. I think we've been more than fair with them. To be honest, I don't know how many permits that they have outstanding right now. I don't know that number. I just know that they've requested to open up another six areas of the city. So, yeah. Mr. Robinson. So, Eric, we've talked about this at the MPO meeting yes. in the in a Dig One's policy. So, what, what are we doing relative to uh, contractor coordination? Are they are they providing you with a plan of what they're going to do this year, and are you coordinating those activities with the Department of Public Works and the utilities? Oh, sure. They, yeah, are, they. Are they They've provided us plans. I mean, we've kicked them back before we've issued the permits to make sure that their plans are adequate um, and accurate for, you know. So when we go out and check to make sure that, you know, that they're showing any conflicts on their plans, our storm, water, sewer, what, whatever it is. So engineering is taking care of all that, that review before the permits go out. Um, but again, you know, if they don't get that permit closed out or if they, are delayed on materials and have to go back, they have to call in or relocate, you know, when they go back 10, 12 days later. And so that's running into a problem with our staffing issues so right now. So when they, when they do the permit, what are the components of the permit? I know last year there were a lot of concerns over 6th Street. And yep. They're ripping it up and leaving it, uh, creating some accessibility issues for handicapped, uh, you know, in, on Bridge yep. Street and, and others. So what mechanisms do we have to make sure that they're completing work in a timely manner, dealing with handicapped accessibility and uh, other things when they're working in the right of way? Yeah, the, the only thing, like we updated our ordinance. Our ordinance was always that if you, if you pull an excavation permit and it's approved, then you have 30 days to close that permit out. So 
that's always been in our ordinance. Um, the city hasn't necessarily been good at enforcing that. Uh, so, um, but we have with TDS, and this year we have started enforcing that 30-day timeline. That's really the, I guess, the biggest hammer that we have. Um, and then they have to come back and ask for that permit again, you know, pay that fee, go through that process, and, and tell us what it is. But then they get another 30 days. Um, so when we issue that permit, and let's say they don't have it 100% done, because you'll see throughout the city they have their conduit coming out of the ground, and it's the vaults, I guess, that they're having a hard time getting in. But they're going to have to go back and dig those vaults in, and they're going to call in another relocate for water and sewer and utilities, and so we're going to be back out there locating that again um, when that does come in. So. Um, so some of the issues that we've had with the locates is they'll call in, let's say, six blocks of a street, right? Well, they won't say the west side, the east side, north side, south side, and then so we go out and um, we have the plans, and it shows the plans that were approved that they're going to be on, like, this side of the street, right? So that's the side we'll mark, but then their subcontractors will come out and say, well, we want to switch to this side of the street, and then we... <laughs> We have to spend time going through and telling them, no, that's, you know, it was approved for this side of the street, this is the one, you know. So every time the locate comes in, it's been a challenge um, from engineering all the way down to the actual locates. And um, so we want to work with them. We want to work with everybody that wants to do excavation. Um, you know, we do have certain teeth as far as, um, you know, not issuing the permit and stuff again. But if we issued it initially and they aren't done yet, obviously we want them to get done. So um, issuing more permits to kind of compound the problem seems to be not a good solution at, at, at this point, you know. So I don't, um, I do, you, we had a hard time at the beginning as well with TDS trying to understand where they were going to put their lines. They showed their lines on one side of the street or the other. They sent them to us, but they didn't have any other facilities on there. They didn't show sidewalks. They didn't show our water, sewer, storm. So we kicked them all back to them, you know. And so they got started late, probably three weeks later or three months later than what they wanted to because of that. And so, um, but in the engineering office, too, we don't, I mean, we can't watch them 24 7, 16 crews around the city. And so we're, following up with them the best that we can. And really, this is the only control that we have with them throughout the city or the issuance of these permits and allowing them to work in different areas. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, John. But So I think one of the concerns is that the statutes aren't favorable to local units of government in our ability to control mm -mm. those activities. So do you feel as if the the limiting the, the scope of their work by through a limited number of, of uh, permits is going to be enforceable? I do. Um, you know that they're not going to be able to work in these areas. Um, I haven't talked with the attorneys. Uh, you know, if they do start working in an area that they don't have a permit for, I, I don't know what the city's ability is. Um, for forfeitures on that or any sort of other action, I don't know. So what is the city's ordinance as it relates to, I submit a permit, is there a timeliness provision where it has to be approved within a certain period of time and in what basis is there for denial? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's um, a laundry list of things that they have to provide with that. You know, they have to show any conflicts. They have to show plans on what they're doing. They have to, you know, and be detailed enough. And if they're not, if we can't really discern what they're doing, then we just kick them back. And I think that the engineering has to review those within 10 days. Um, and then we have to respond at that point on those permits. And do we receive as belts at the end of the day? Uh, no, I don't believe that we're going to receive as built um, from them. I think that they are going to have, I don't think they're surveying, you know, just like all utilities, they don't survey in their facilities. They just have uh, general drawings of where their facilities are. So 
Are they digging, trenching, or, or boring? You know? They're directional drilling, but their capabilities are limited. I think the furthest they can drill with the equipment they have is like 50 or 75 feet. So you'll see a lot of sidewalk sections pulled, you'll see, you know, so, yeah. So are you, I, I noticed that they appear to be working on First Avenue this year, right after you redid mm -hmm. First Avenue last year. Are you sharing your capital improvement projects with them and encouraging them to be working in advance of your projects? Yeah, I mean, we've shared with them what work we are doing. I mean, we've shared with them, engineering has shared different projects that we're doing, um, where they're proposing to work. Uh, as permits have gotten issued, we're sharing that information as well. Um, so, you know, we're working with them as much as, as we can. Uh, usually they're, they're okay, but, you know, you have subcontractors upon subcontractors out there, and they're coming in, and they're you know, on the street, sometimes they just, they see a sheet and that's all they see. They don't know anything else. And so, um, but you know, the problem is to, for us to be out there is frequently, you know, on inspection, we don't have that capability. Yeah. So this is a unique situation. We knew it going into it. Uh, we mended our ordinance accordingly. We've sat down and talked with them, but, um, again, you know, I, I think through the permit process is really the, the strongest, you know, you know, avenue that we have to restrict where they're working and try to be able to keep up with them as they're working through the city. So from a policy perspective then, Eric, what are you requesting in, of the commission that we cap the number of active permits? I, I think that um, I, I would just like support, you know, basically stating that the, you know, um, you know, that the commission would like for us not to issue any additional permits until permits, you know, existing permits are closed out. So they close a permit out, we'll issue one more, you know, that, so we're not adding to and compounding the problem that we have, so. And again, do we have the authority to do that? I think you have the authority to support that, you know. Um, you know, I, I don't know, um, I mean, from a staff perspective, according to the ordinance, the city engineer or myself has the direction not to issue those permits. But I think one of the things that if, if push comes to shove with TDS, they may be before the council or, or other body, you know, um, asking for us to issue those permits and stuff. And I think from the rest of the staff in the city, it's not that much of an issue, but for the utility staff and we're short, you know, the shorthanded and having people out just doing locates, um, you know, if we're not able to keep up and something happens, then we're on the hook, you know, we're liable. Because we have three days to do those locates, or 24 hours if it's an emergency or a relocate. So, um, so to me, that's a, that's a problem, and I don't want to get into that situation with that liability, so. So is there work around, and I apologize for the, the questions, but so, is their strategy then going to be if we limit it one quid pro quo, one for one, that they then bring an excavation permit in for a, a broader area? Um, so you, you take no, a... No, we've already delineated the areas with them that, you know, so we said there's this many permits, these are the areas, and then we're gonna issue these permits as you request them, you know, and as, as you have crews in to do them, but now, they just want to continue on and opening up additional permits, but not having the others fully closed out, and it's becoming a problem. So, so no, those areas for the additional permits are already delineated. So, yeah. You need a motion? I do. Um, I see that. Uh, that oh, would you like to approach the mic? Thanks. Hi, Deborah Ryan, 702 Elm. It just happens, um, I got calls just this past Friday from on the far west side, that, and then um, I did chat with uh, Becky, that um, there was a number of neighbors that were not, had not gotten any type of postcards indicating TDS was coming in. And I guess I've heard that has happened in other areas of the city as well. And then, um, so I had some neighbors that 
you know, our kind of country lots within the city limits without sidewalk. And they were okay about how they were doing things, but they were just shocked about no notification. And at a certain point, I did talk with them about there are some laterals that may be done soon and should this be done can you coordinate this trenching and that and they said well we don't have those kind of permits yet to go to individual houses but that our trenching is very minimal uh, just I guess a few inches underground but it does kind of bring up that there's more discussion by neighbors of saying why didn't the city let us know or why didn't TDS let us know and so if you're having these other issues, I think you should bring up this other communication because it's, if there's a number of areas that have not received any postcards, it's, it's, it's looking like, is it, this, it, is it the city's fault or is there some miscommunication going on? So to try to resolve it better for our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's part of it too. You know, their communication plan to us was door hangers, was mailings and other things. We've had other areas and people state that they weren't notified, you know, before this. We've, uh, you know, continually addressed that with TDS and their management um, and hoping that it gets better. But obviously if Deb's just gotten additional calls, we'll have to reiterate that with them again on making sure that the residents, that they're notifying the residents before they come in. So. So I guess I would entertain a motion, and I'm wondering if we want to approach this from a more holistic policy of, uh, in general, how we would approach a topic like this, or if there's something more specific uh, to this instance we need to consider. Mr. Robinson. Eric, what would happen if we went with a graduated permit fee and that is every time the permit was renewed the price went up um, in essence creating some incentives to complete the work the first time yeah I mean we, we can certainly do that that affects other permits within the city as well you know so it's in an individual permits residents that do permits and things like that so we had looked at larger scale fees for the permits but, you know, we didn't want to penalize individual residents who want to, you know, do their drive approach or do, you know, sidewalk replacement on their own by penalizing them with higher, um, you know, rates uh, for excavation permits. Do most of those people complete within the time of the initial uh, You know, not all of them. Sometimes they're at the mercy of their contractors, you know. They, they anticipate. I mean, 30 days, that's where we haven't really been real tight on, on enforcing that until really this year. And... Um, I think one of the, you know, um, I think also too with, uh, we looked at various items. I do think that if there's a way that we can structure that and not penalize the homeowners, you know, that, that want to make improvements to their property, I think that something that we should continually look at. Uh, but right now we don't have that provision in. And so, um, and I don't know how we do that without, you know, penalizing the homeowners and stuff, you know, make that. Um, you know, and then we also have to, WPS has been a fairly decent partner, you know, doing their work with excavation permits and stuff, and, and we've worked with them as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think the idea is great. I, I don't know exactly how we do that or structure that, and if that would be in time for what TDS is doing at this point in time. So, yeah. I guess I, I kind of like where you're headed, and I think there's definitely a difference between a a business um, and a, a private individual doing their own work. I don't know what it looks like when we issue permits, if, if that's not a different process, or it could it be? I don't know as far as a, the way you issue those permits and all that. Yeah, we had talked about issuing different permits, you know, like a, like a different type of permit for a utility project, such as with WPS or Frontier or whoever it might be, you know, versus um, a permit for a drive approach or a curb or something like that, you know. So um, we would have to explore that and see how we would how we would break that out, um, you know. And then where those permits, we have some permits that go through inspection, some that go through engineering, 
you know, that touch the streets and things like that. So I think when we redid the ordinance, we were already getting stuff from TDS and I think we looked at it and tried to get the ordinance changed in time, you know, before, but I do think that there's definitely some improvements that we can make on these ordinances, you know, over time that might be beneficial for the city and give us more teeth on, on how we handle these uh, larger projects. Mr. Forrest. Just in the interest of moving on, I would move that we support uh, Eric's recommendation that we not issue any new per permits to TDS until their existing permits and, and uh, permits are, com are completed. Um, and then just as a thought, if we want to take this up on a larger scale to apply to more activity of this type, we come back to that at a future meeting. Do you have a second? Second by Jean. Uh, discussion, Mr. Jean. I don't think that's what the request though was, uh, but I understood your motion. I, I understood that they would get a new permit if they completed a permit. Is that correct? His motion is that there's going to be no more permits until they have those completed. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that what you want? I was reading Eric, trying to read Eric's uh, note there, but I'm away from my notes uh, at the mic. So it, I think it's not issue any new permits until existing permits were completed. Right. Is it, right. Does think, that cover your concern, Jim? It, it does. That's how it's written, Jim. Oh, and, okay. and, and, I, but, I, I, I but I'm thinking that maybe it's like if they close one, we'll issue one. Right. You know, kind of a one for one. I may not have written that. Oh, very I, I well. would certainly rephrase my motion okay. to reflect that. Okay. And I'll, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll agree. Is there more discussion on this? Yeah, Mr. Robinson. For clarification, then, we are capping the number of permits based upon workload and the ability of the staff to time to respond in a timely manner given the priorities of the department. Just for explanation. Yeah, I think so that's, we're, that's we're, the attempt here for, for us to do that. Mr. Jean. Uh, I think I'm correct in saying this, but you can, staff can correct me, but our utilities typically are quite a bit deeper than where they're working. The only place that we have a, a risk is probably a manhole or valves or uh, curb stops because they would be going through the area of elevation. Uh, but it's still, I understand, it's a great deal of, of extra work to go back out there and freshen up those lines. They're, right. ty they're typically there, but I don't, I don't think the curb stops would necessarily be there because that flag might have been gone. Do we leave a flag for them? Do we paint the grass blue there, or what I? Both. Okay. So, but that's that means they'd have to be remarked. Right, and it, it, to, part of it too, when we've talked with them, is that you know, if if we do have a line running there and they're running their line there, is not not to have it right on top, mm -hmm. you know, to to have some separation, and so they are lower. I mean, we are deeper, but you know, to make sure that there's some practicality for, you know, the future when we are doing work and, yeah, so. Is there any more discussion? Okay, the motion is to not issue any new permits until the other permits are closed out, clarifying one permit closes, another one can open. Yeah. All right, you. all those in favor uh, can signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, the next topic, item number five, discussion and possible action on the wastewater treatment facility compliance and maintenance annual report. Thank you. So annually, we provide the compli you know, the CMAR um, to to the state, Dave prepares that with the information that he has down at the wastewater facility. Um, it's in, enclosed in the packet uh, for you to review. I, I referred to Dave to highlight some of the, maybe some of the narratives and some of the issues we've had this past year. Dave, your your mic, Dave. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Part of it's sort of a self-evaluation. Part of it, the computer plugs some numbers in for us. And it was pretty harsh on us with the BOD results. It's kind of arguing a technicality, but 
I believe in January and February we passed because we our average was 30 and the limit was 30. But if there was a rounding over the number, then the computer failed us. But it's sort of a self-evaluation so we can decide what our issues are and address them. So there isn't any point in, in my opinion, arguing over the, the details. We were, if we didn't exceed the limit, we were darn, darn close to it. So there's not much of a difference. Um, the BOD is what I'm specifically referring to, and that's on that effluent quality. Um, there's an issue called nitrification, where the ammonia, we, we want the wastewater system to break that ammonia down to um, nitrogen, and then that has uh, nitrate and nitrite has oxygen. And when that doesn't happen, it happens in the lab when we do the BOD test, so it skews those BOD results, because then that ammonia gets broken down the nitrogen, the nitrate, and the nitrite absorb oxygen, and then that makes us fail the BOD test. So mm -hmm. that's the problem we have. And so partly it's not exceeding the BOD that we're required to comply with, but on the other hand, whether it's the ammonia or whether it's the BOD, it's still absorbing oxygen, and if we were discharging to a trout stream, it'd be sort of the same issue that way. So, we had a problem in January because the weather was particularly cold, and so the temperature got low, and when the temperature of the wastewater gets below maybe 50 degrees, it's hard to keep these nitrifying bacteria going, and once you lose them, it's hard to get them reestablished. So we were fighting that in January, February, March, and April, and then in addition, in March and April, we had some pretty big storms that kind of flushed through our plants, so we lost some of our solids. So then we had some individual days with high spikes of BOD that really was BOD. And so we ended up with four months that um, failed the, according to this, the BOD results. And so that got us down to an F grade. Um, we understand the problem. We haven't had a problem with it this last year. Our new plant will have several things that will help us control this better. We're going to have a new final clarifier that will give us another 33% of the capacity in the clarification. We'll have a better um, system of controlling what's going on in the aeration tanks so we can have better control over it. And so um, we kind of got caught on this time, but in the future that will be corrected with the money we're spending in, uh, in uh, investing in our wastewater treatment plan. So that was, that, that was the main thing that's kind of alarming. Um, we also failed one month for uh, phosphorus control. It was a failure of our pump to keep pumping the alum that helps us to keep that down. Caused a high spike uh, over a short period of time. The rest of the year we did fine for the phosphorus. The system worked well. And so those were the two main events. This is the report for 2019, not 2020. Um, in 2020, I would anticipate we're going to fail the uh, section that refers to having adequate staffing, but um, we're working on that too. So by the time we fail it, we'll have the system in works to correct the problem. And that's a self-reporting issue. We could certainly discuss it, but uh, we've, we've got issues with Mr. Staff. Jean. So <clears throat> 30 is the limit. Yep. And so what computer makes the distinction that it should, it's over 30? Um, our limit is 30, not 30.0. So 30.4 would be passing. But the computer, it just compares it to 30. And so the computer programmer that wrote it wasn't an environmental engineer. So if it's higher than 30, they call it a failure. So it's sort of splitting hairs. We don't want to be that close to the limit anyway. But that's where I say it passed, the computer says it fails. Is it DNR computer? Yeah. yeah. So does it, do they take the effluent? They take, they, the take, they take the monthly report? They take the monthly report, and they fill out this chart for us. And then the computer calculates that and calls it a failure. So, so. do you report it in decimal, 30.4? It's a monthly average. So we report the numbers. But then when it averages them, then it comes up. Actually, the, the DNR, the reports are kind of notorious. It's probably 30.379876 or something like that. That's just the way it is on their system. So, so you report every day. 
the way I remember it is you could round it down. Did they change that when it was less than 3.5? When it was less than 3.5. Well, oh, oh, that was instead of a 0.5 or something. If it was 0.5 or higher, I think you had to round it up. Sure, and that's what that's exactly what I'm saying. On the monthly average, if it's 30.5, if it's less than 30.5, that would round down to 30, and we would be meeting that requirement. But on a computer system, it shows a failure because of how the DNR has their system set up. It takes into account that decimal, which is above 30. So if you, I mean, we we kind of went through this with phosphorus too. We went like, through it with phosphorus. Yeah, like we had like a couple times where we had like 1.01 .01 or you know 1.14 or something you know our limit is one and so it said we failed but you know we're still at one because we round and so for whatever reason their computer uh, when they run these limits um, if we're 30.1 or 30.01 it's going to call us a fail even though the document says 30 correct because it doesn't show the decimals that, that go up. Well, then I think the numbers should. So they generate this page, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, again, I, um, I thought it was us making that assumption that it failed. Sure. Okay. And it, it, in one hand, it's a little frustrating, but if we're at 29.9 consistently, we should bring that to our attention and figure out what we're going to do about that because we're nearly failing. So I, I don't see it as a big deal in the overall sense. Um, it's calling our attention to the fact that we were running near the limit on our BLD. And there's a technical reason for it, and we're, we got the solution in the works. So. Mr. Force. Uh, Eric, those Commodore 64s just aren't very accurate. They're right. <laughs> uh, Dave, what, can, can you quickly summarize for us what in the new plant is going to prevent these BOD excursions? Um, there's some stuff I have to learn, but we're going to have a new, uh, it's escaping me the name of it. We have a new uh, effluent before it goes into the aeration tanks. The aeration tanks is where this process of consuming yes. the BOD happens. And before that happens, we're going to have a sort of an agnostic zone. We'll play, be able to play a little bit with the, um, biophosphorus removal yes but they didn't think our um, nutrients they didn't think we'd have a lot of success with that okay. but we'll have some control before it goes into the aeration tanks over what the pH is and and uh, you'll have an anoxic zone and have an anoxic cool. zone. and then in the aeration tanks right now back in the 60s it was designed and we have six um, aeration tanks right we only use three right back at that time I remember when the library the air conditioner just ran cold water through it Nobody does that anymore. And so the projections for how much water we were going to be using, they over-projected. And so in the future, though, instead of running through three tanks in parallel, if you know what I mean, there's yep. going to be two sets of three tanks in series. So we'll have more aeration tanks in service. Cool. Um, we'll be able to adjust and control the DO as it passes through the system. Mm -hmm. And that's where there's a learning curve for me, but we've got engineers to work with on that. The other so question. That'll help. Okay. And then, and then the final right. thing is Sorry. we'll have a final, another final clarifier. Right now we have two smaller ones and one bigger one, and we'll add another third bigger one. And those two small ones have roughly the same volume as each of the bigger ones. So we'll go from two, roughly two tanks to three tanks. I mean, we'll increase it by a third. The, the last question: What what are the ramifications of this report? Um, In other words, we know what happens when we violate. Our permit, the, the, but what happens when we have a an F or a D or something on this report? Um, nothing. I think the intent of it is to make sure I'm not hiding things from you guys. This brings it out on the table. Let's the city council take a look at it. We outline what we're going to do about it. Every it's up. I think it's you know it's not a bad thing, and uh, I don't think we should be concerned about not getting straight A's when we got an issue. This should help point out that issue, and then everybody's aware of it, and then we can work together to address it. So uh, um, it's a little disheartening, but um, yeah, it's not really a problem. It's just bringing it up in front of everybody's attention. Mr. Jean. 
I, I agree with uh, that that statement that it's it, it's pointing that there could be a problem and that we need to try to work through that. But got to ask a question: as far as the number of violations, not considering this report, how many violations of BOD did we have in 19 for effluent? Two. Two. Two okay, months of thank you. Uh, complaints. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do we need to vote to approve this and pass it on somewhere, or do we just place this on file? Oh. We'll make a motion to pass this on to the council. They have to review it and, and approve the resolution. Yeah. But, I, but I have one other question. When is it due, or was it extended? It was extended because okay. of the COVID, COVID issue. Okay, I had a motion by Jean. Do I have a second? Second by Herbst. Is there any further discussion here? All right, I think we're prepared to vote on accepting this and forwarding it on to council. All those in favor can say hi. Aye. Opposed? This motion passes unanimously. Uh, the next two items, six and seven, I am pulling from the agenda. We have a couple more discussions internally that need to take place um, about these topics, so um, we can expect to have a uh, discussion about this at a later time. Um, so we're moving on to item number eight, discussion and possible action on the conservation campaign branding proposal. Um, Commissioner, Horse, would you like to give a little uh, presentation or discussion, start right. us off? Yes, uh, we've been talking about this for a number of meetings and we took some action at the last meeting to seek a proposal um, for a relatively small amount uh, of money uh, and it was recommended that we uh, talk with Gerald Mortensen at uh, Morty and the Makers, which is a local, locally owned uh, advertising agency. That agency has done some very uh, good quality work for the Marathon County Solid Waste Commission, and we talked with uh, them about the work, and they were quite pleased, and recommended that uh, they would be that uh, Gerald would be a good uh, firm to look at for this campaign. So I talked with uh, Gerald, uh, shared those conversations with Scott and Steve, and I think others, and Gerald has come back with this um, proposal. Uh, the total uh, dollars uh, amount to 4500 and his uh, work is broken out into a number of specific projects that uh, he and his staff would uh, undertake uh, to give us uh, a set of deliverable, deliverables which are listed there. And that would include a creative brief which would be based on an analysis uh, of the situation and interviews with key people, uh, and then design, which would include logos, uh, name, uh, maybe some adver and some advertising mock-ups that we uh, could select from, uh, some copywriting, uh, creative direction and project management for a total of 4,500. And uh, he also included a website uh, that we could look at to see some of the uh, other work that he has done. Um, the deliverables actually are on page one at the bottom. Creative brief, multiple logo, brand identities for consideration, taglines for consideration, uh, revisions as required, multiple presentations, multiple channels. So as far as I'm concerned, um, I have worked with Mortensen in the past on some Monk Gardens work, uh, much of what you have seen uh, regarding the Monk Gardens a graphic approach is Gerald's work, and I think he's uh, excellent at this. He's very enthusiastic about it. I think his price is in line, and uh, I would certainly recommend that we, we go ahead and, and commission this work. Is that a motion? I will make it. Do I have a second? Second by Jean. Um, discussion, Mr. Robinson. So Multilingual approach, is that envisioned in here? I uh, didn't mention it, but certainly that uh, can be brought, brought up. And, and, and then just by way of background, last time I promised I would do some research on Rain Barrel, and I provided a number of links, and I can send that electronically to various uh, proposals and approaches that other communities have taken. I would hope that we would incorporate that uh, one of the long-term questions would be for, you know, for future discussion is whether or not 
the the commission the utility or city has an interest in from a stormwater management perspective and water reduction perspective an interest in subsidizing or discounting the cost of those rain barrels so i think we can put that on for a future agenda but here are some here are some links to thunder bay superior uh lake superior thunder you know other places I see that as being part of the program, but a separate piece mm -hmm. that's developed separately because of the funding and management issues that are connected with a rain barrel program. Uh, so I think we want to concentrate at this point on the homeowner program. Um, languages, John Mung, Spanish. Are you thinking of more? I, I still think that there are some issues relative to Hmong, uh, issues in translation um, with older older homeowners potentially. I think that I would defer to um, city staff as to okay. what the acceptance rate is or the, the, the preference is, but I would think that you'd want to look at potentially Spanish and, and potentially Hmong. I think um, just to add on to your discussion about Hmong language, you know, there's green versus white, and we've done, um, when we're doing audio, we choose one dialect over the other. So I think we can do, we can have a multi-approach here. Is there any other discussion? Yeah, Mr. Dean. Out of curiosity, is this a local firm? Yes. Okay. Any other discussion? All right, are we ready to vote? Um, all those in favor of uh, approving this, uh, this water, what am I calling this, an ad campaign uh, through, with G. Morty and the makers can signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously, so I think we can pass it on to your team, Eric, to continue the discussion unless we have the commissioner continue. I figure we can work out that. All right. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. All right, we're on to item nine, discussion and possible action on implementing a forfeiture citation for unauthorized use of a fire hydrant. Why don't you give us a little background on this? Sure. So um, we had, uh, again, with TDS and other contractors in the city, um, they've found it fairly convenient to pull water off of our hydrants uh, without permission. We have an ordinance in place, it's 1352 water for construction, that uh, special permission has to be given um, by the director before they can use a hydrant and there's certain procedures and, and items that they have to, to use um, in order to, to pull water off of the hydrant and there's a fee as well. Um, at this point, we really don't have a fine or, uh, you know, to go back to them other than potentially just try to charge them for what we feel the water that they pulled off of that hydrant was. But every time they connect to a hydrant that isn't proper, there's a contamination potential. And so um, I feel that within the ordinance, uh, we should have some more teeth on a fine if we can prove whether it's through photos or whatever. Uh, to find that contractor for pulling off. They have water stations and stuff in places that they can get water uh, properly. And so I would, um, I would recommend a, a fine of somewhere around 500 to $750 if they're caught to do, doing that. Um, I, they have to make it a, a significant deterrent for them. Uh, and we would, if that is approved, um, through the ordinance, I would say that we would definitely send that out to all contractors once that this is approved. So, Mr. Robinson, I I would agree with Eric in, in the need for this, but I would also put in a provision that should that Im, that illegal connection result in cross contamination, that the mm. party be responsible for 100% of the costs associated with very good um, addressing that cross contamination because you're going to be in chlorination and potentially wasting a lot of water. I think that we would want to, as a disincentive for them doing it improperly, make sure that they cover our costs. So, Is that a motion? I would move that we direct staff to develop a modification to the um, water for construction ordinance, creating a penalty, which includes a monetary fine, as well as a um, liability associated with cross-contamination issues. Do you have a second? Second by Gene. Any discussion, Mr. Oh, Gene? Oh. oh, clarification. Um, 
directing staff to deem an appropriate? I think it needs to be high enough. Yes, 750. Okay. Okay. Mr. Jean. I'm okay with that. Okay. Um, I'm reading through this, and I thought I understood it, but is there, is that water metered? The question is, is the water metered? As they're drawing it from the hydrant, I see they talk about the reduced pressure uh, valve, zone valve. We do have a meter with an RPZ on it. Um, what happened is we got rid of uh, the construction meters because they were no longer legal um, with lead limits and what so have you. And we had a lot of contractors that would come and check them out and then they'd ride around in their trucks for the entire summer without any use. So um, the utility has been setting that meter um, when absolutely necessary. Otherwise we're requiring them to get water at our bulk stations. Um, well, the other issue that we do run into is our our hydrants are backward compared to the rest of the world. So we run into a lot of breakaways and, and hydrant shafts that are either twisted or broke off um, from contractors using them without knowing that they turn the other way. So another issue that gets presented with unauthorized use. Is there any other discussion? Or are we ready to vote? We just have a comment. Ms. Herbst. Um, was this just brought to your attention by homeowners or somebody that this was pointed out to you that they've been using the water from the hydrants? Yeah, we've had city staff uh, notice, you know, asking why contractors are allowed to use hydrants when, you know, typically our staff has to coordinate that with the utility directly. And so um, this year it's come up at several times. You know, it, it, you know we've seen it. And uh, we did revise this ordinance. I, geez, I, I don't know. Um, when that was, Scott, maybe six or eight months ago, um, you know, to require the RPZ and to also um, update some of the costs and stuff. But we didn't put in a forfeiture or a fine or anything like that because we didn't think we had this significant of a problem, but we're starting to have a problem. So So at this point, though, we would be able to enforce the fine? I, once it's once the ordinance is approved, okay. which would have to go to council. Okay. Yeah. Any Thank other you. discussion? Right. All those in favor of uh, <laughs> directing staff to craft a new ordinance, including a fine and any penalty and any contamination costs, uh, can signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Jean. Going back to the items that you pull from the yep. agenda, is it fair for me to assume that somebody has an issue with the CDL being suspended? Um, it's we need to have a couple more internal discussions um, including our HR department um, about those specific policies Well, I understand that I respect that but I, is this employee still on on the payroll or is not? Yes, okay, and Nothing will happen for, unless we don't make a decision on modifying the policy. I Mean it would he, something could happen if we don't modify the policy. Maybe that's a better way of saying it Right. I think right now the city does not have a policy on, okay. on doing it, you know, so um, I think it's in our interest to talk about having a policy and bringing something forward that will work uh, for the utility. So I think we need to have some more discussions on that internally. Because of the issue of getting staff, I, I think we Correct. should follow, come up with some policy to help address that if we can. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. If I could just weigh in on that, I, I think one of the concerns that I had uh, with this is, you know, first of all, it appears as if we've delegated the responsibility to the Director of Public Works in the Human Resources Department. But secondly, is that the utility is not is part of the city, and I would want to make sure that whatever policy we have is consistent across all departments within the city, whether it's Department of Public Works or the, the Commission. And so I, I, I support pulling it to, to look at the, the broader ramifications for all employees because the citizens think that all employees are city employees. All right. Uh, with that, I would take a motion to adjourn. Motion by Jean. Second by Robinson. Thank you for joining us. We are adjourned. <laughs>